Okay. So thank you again, um, Ronan and Yael and Ella for making all the possible. The that was the the overview of the entrepreneurship lab and the uh, Desert program, the uh, Israel Entrepreneurship Initiative. And the uh, second part of tonight was to talk about ecosystems. So when we planned the event, um, thought it, it might be helpful for people to hear a bit about the New York City entrepreneurial ecosystem, especially as you know people that participate in the program would be coming to New York, but I'm sure a lot of other people are interested in, in New York. And I would talk about that, and then we'll also hear about Tel Aviv's um, ecosystem. So this whole word ecosystem has been getting a lot of attention recently. This is a site that New York City just launched uh, a couple months ago. It's digital.nyc. So the TLD, the top level domain is .nyc for New York City. Digital.nyc is a, is a, a great resource. And here you could see in this uh, map, and even at last night's um, GEW, Global Entrepreneurship Week, someone who works for Mapped, Mapped Me um, was there and spoke. But these are all startups and investors and meetings. And you could see, you know, close to 6,000 startups, 159 investors, jobs, upcoming events, et cetera. And this is all on, on this one site. So wherever the ecosystem is, whether in uh, Tel Aviv, New York, um, Silicon Valley, what are some of the things that six businesses will need, high growth ventures will need? The old way of thinking was, you know, Silicon Valley is um, working and is great, so let's try to replicate Silicon Valleys all over. But it doesn't work because everyone has a unique path and unique attributes and unique ecosystems. So we see that, you know, what works in Silicon Valley can't just be replicated in, in New York or any other city, but there are some unique things. A trained workforce, you know, is incredibly important. Formal and informal uh, networks, networks like the MIT Enterprise Forum, um, universities. If you look at where all these around the world, not just in the U.S., these great um, startup areas are, they're around universities. Obviously, around Stanford in Silicon Valley, around MIT and Harvard in Cambridge, around Pace in New York, okay, around Columbia and NYU and Rockefeller University, um, Tel Aviv University here. You know the role of Technion. Um, experts, academics, public, private, um, educated investors at angel networks, and we see the, the networks here. Um, promotional efforts coordinated. Um, airports. I thought that was interesting. Why airports? Intellectual capital doesn't travel by car or by rail or by steamship. It's by airports, and you need a, you know, a, a good airport to attract the people. Telecommunications infrastructure, quality of life, and support from regulatory authorities. So that's basics of, of what they need. But I thought what was interesting is if we're going to talk about ecosystems and we're in a university, how about a framework? So this framework is from um, Daniel Eisenberg at Babson. You, you may know Babson University. It's a very well-known entrepreneurial program. Um, I spoke in London a couple months ago at the Global Consortium of Entrepreneurship Centers, and one of the talks was on ecosystems, and they wanted to use this as a framework. So this is um, you know, this, uh, Daniel Eisenberg from Babson, and he talks about around the ecosystem, you know, there's corporations, associations, foundations. You can see the media, investors, financing, government. And uh, I was on a panel with somebody from Harvard, somebody from um, a, a rural part of the U.S., somebody from uh, Scandinavia, and we're all asked to outline our ecosystem. So what are those associations? So of course, there's the MIT Enterprise Forum, and they ask for you know, the strengths, gaps, and unique identifiers. So for strengths for New York, I wrote center of the known universe. The only gap I could think of was modesty. <laughs> and for the unique identifiers, um, you know, again, I don't, there's no need to go through all of the, the circles, but you, you could see, um, you know, New York, 135 colleges and universities. When um, Mayor Bloomberg talked about launching um, the Cornell Technion, 
you know, his critics said, you know, listen, you know, New York City is not, you know, a, a college town, you know, that's Boston. And Mayor Bloomberg pointed out to his critic that New York City has more college students than Boston has people. So there's 135 colleges and universities in New York. And you could see, you know, government, financing, obviously financing, um, corporations, you know, 10% of the Fortune 500 companies are, are in New York City. Um, foundations, organizations, uh, the, the media, etc. But one thing I wanted to, to talk about today is something that's not in this diagram, and that's the perceptions, perceptions of desirability. How desirable is it to be in this ecosystem? Because that's what attracts, you know, talent, and that's what attracts investors. And Bloomberg also pointed out that talent attracts capital much better than capital attracts talent. And you have to have the talent. So what is it? There's a perception. You know, is it good or not so good? And I thought one of the really interesting things about New York's ecosystem is the 2008 financial crisis. That crisis actually helped New York more than anything else as far as entrepreneurship. Because before, we, we had lots of engineers and bright people, but they were all in the canyons of Wall Street. You know, MIT talked about how horrible it is that all these brilliant people are working, you know, as quant jocks for hedge funds instead of out doing real engineering. Well, with the 2008 financial crisis, not only did the big banks stop hiring people, but it let some go, and then they were able to, to work um, in this canyons of Silicon Alley instead of the canyons of Wall Street, but also the whole perception of working, you know, at a top, you know, a Goldman Sachs or whatever on Wall Street suddenly went from very, very desirable to, you know, these guys are the greedy people that almost destroyed the world economy. Now it's great and sexy to work for startups. And you see that in universities in New York. Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania has always been a top MBA program. Their um, applications had started to decline because you know, their main strength is finance, and Philadelphia is not known as an entrepreneurial center. And people now all want to go to you know, Stanford or Stanford of the East, Harvard, as it's now being called, because you know, there's this whole tech and entrepreneurial ecosystem. So I'll talk a little bit about that, but also a comprehensive strategy. It's not just about cutting some red tape or doing a marketing campaign. Something Bloomberg did was all of these different things, from short-term to long-term, like he's out of office and you know, the Cornell Technion campus won't be up and running, built for years, right? But that's something that is you know, beyond his election cycle. So there was some short-term things, some long-term things, but a, a comprehensive strategy to bring a lot of things together. And you know, Steve Blank, who you may know as an entrepreneur, he says that people won't appreciate everything that you know, the, the then mayor did for, for 10 years. Um, and he talked about how there was a, a few people as influential in Silicon Valley. But with those perceptions of desirability, I thought I'd just go through a, a few big events in New York, just a couple. Obviously, the stock market crash of 1929 was a defining event. Um, I don't know if people know what it was like to live in New York City back in the 70s. This is um, a famous headline from the Daily News. Ford, you know, um, Gerald Ford to city drop dead. Vows he'll veto, veto any bailout. New York City was bankrupt. It was, it was a horrible place to live. I was just talking to friends that had moved up to Vermont was up there skiing. I said, when, when you go out in the city, like for a jog, you would always put a few $5 bills in your pocket. Why? Because when you go out, you're going to get mugged. And if you don't have something to give the mugger, they're going to be upset. Every time we parked in the city, you know, as you go back to your car, you're peering around the corner to see if someone smashed into the windows. It was a horrible place to, to live and to work. Some other things, you know, here's you know, the NASDAQ, you know, you know what happened in, um, you know, March 10th, 2000, you know, it reached a uh, peak over 5,000, dropped 80 percent. But this is something that had caught my eye, this, again, with the financial crisis, after a reversal of fortune, City takes a new look at Wall Street. 
what happened was there's been all these trends, um, cycles in New York, you know, from uh, the financial, before the financial crisis. And what the city, and particularly Bloomberg, as mayor recognizes, this is not just a cycle that's going to come back. And the financial industry is obviously a big part of New York, a third of its tax revenue, a third of its jobs, especially high quality jobs. So what do you do? And he said, we have to create an entrepreneurial startup community in New York. Now, there was a little bit of one in you know, the late 90s, Silicon Alley, but with the financial crisis, it, I mean, I'm sorry, with the dot-com bubble, it, it just disappeared overnight. It was all sizzle, no stake. It, it collapsed immediately. But with the financial crisis of 2008, it really started developing something. But what he said, there was this thing, the next chapter in the history of Wall Street is being written right now. Never has there been such a need for a cultural and intellectual shift in thinking on Wall Street. So in other words, again, it's not just a a cycle. We've got to do something. And it wasn't a startup community in New York in 2008. Again, in, in March of 2000, when the NASDAQ bubble crashed, What little bit there was that was, again, all smoke and mirrors, disappeared basically overnight. So um, that was 2008, 2009. There was an interesting thing in The Economist, the uh, report on entrepreneurship, global heroes talking about, you know, the difference Joseph Schumpeter, you know, creative destruction versus, you know, traditional thing, Keynesian, you know, John Maynard Keynes about, you know, government spending and pump money into GM to save it, where Schumpeter would have said, you know, let um, GM go bankrupt, creative destruction, so you can have companies like Tesla. So I, I like that. In 2009, here was our holiday card, just uh, doing my part to stimulate the economy. It's my daughter, but while a thespian depiction of Keynesian may elicit humor, is a strict Schumpeterian, as I am. So to give you an idea of the changes in perception of New York and why perception is so important in part of a, a startup ecosystem. Here's just a few shots. 1983, when I finished college, this was the meatpacking district. As a kid, when we went into the meatpacking district, it was, now it's, I don't know if you know, it's the hottest area of New York, right? The High Line ends right there. We just walked over there. It's amazing. This is what it looks like, you know, now. So, uh, Paul McCartney's daughter has a boutique there. It's the most happening place. But when I was growing up and we would go through there, it was meat packing. They would hang carcasses of cows and sawdust on the floor. And there was one good restaurant there, the Homestead. And when I was a Wall Street broker, you had the limousines wait for you while you had dinner. Because when you got out, you don't want to be out in the meat packing district for more than minutes, you know, looking for a cab. It was a, it was a tough place. Um, other changes. The Flatiron Building, you, you may recognize in 1903, back in the 80s, Nobody wanted to work in that area. Everybody wanted to be in a glass and steel sky rise in Midtown, you know, Rockefeller Center. Now nobody wants to work in Midtown, right? Look at, you know, Google's offices, the old um, Port Authority building, a a Mm -hmm. giant thing. Everybody now wants to be in an old pre-war, you know, building. And all the startups, this is like... Ground zero, a term we don't like to use in New York too often, but um, for startups, if you look at that map, they're all around this area, you know, uh, Broadway and uh, 23rd Street. Now it's the hottest place there is. Nobody wants to be in glass and steel uh, towers in Midtown. So again, why is that perception of desirability so important? How does it come and go so quickly? And, uh, And a little bit about the future, you know, obviously Cornell, NYC Tech. So, and I bring that up because, you know, it, th- that perception is so important. And you look at, um, you know, some of the examples given in, like, Startup Nation, you know, what's going on to build this ecosystem? And, and why is it different in, in other countries? You know, even in the Middle East, Dubai, that more of a transactional economy. It takes all these things to make an ecosystem. So as some people here might be interested in what's going on in New York, I just want to go through these slides quickly. But... Here's a couple of things on its tech ecosystem. 7% of the city's workforce, again, it was zero in 2008, almost zero. 100,000 direct jobs, a quarter million additional jobs. The average um, hourly wage is about 50% higher, um, $125 billion in spending, 
$1.6 billion in annual tax revenue. Here's again that map in New York. You could see this. Um, you know, this is where the Flatiron Building is. This hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of startups. And uh, yesterday we were in Hertzley. It's sort of like the WeWork place. That was started by a few kids like three or four years ago that I remember talking to. Um, and now it's, you know, everywhere you'll, you'll see that. But here are some, some stats on in New York City's economy. If you look at this in like funding, so New York just passed Boston or Boston and Cambridge is the number two spot for uh, venture capital investment. I mean, amazing changes all in just a, a few years. But here's a few programs. I'm not going to read through them, but to give you an idea of what New York City's doing for entrepreneurs. And these are, you could just go to NYC EDC for New York City Economic Development Corp. But I just wanted to quickly go through a few of them so you get an idea of the comprehensiveness. Um, artists as entrepreneurs. Here's one, Berlin to New York City. Don't worry, there's also one for Israel to New York City. Um, bio and health tech. Um, Entrepreneurship Lab NYC, that they actually... If mimicry is the greatest form of flattery, they copy that after visiting my lab. And then I'm on their board. It's okay. Um, business to Business, uh, Thrive, Connect NYC, Curate NYC, uh, for designers, for digital workers, for fashion, um, to hire people. Um, here, Israel to New York City, top left, a whole program just for that. Latin America to New York City. Um, New York City Big Ops Contest, broadband maps, uh, Early stage, life science funding initiatives, fashion fellows, fashion career, startups, um, media lab, um, talent drafts, fellows, a pilot health program. You, you could see uh, to support food manufacturers, art clusters, um, small business, wireless corridors, world to New York City. Um, Obviously, people need financing. So aside from the programs, here's some financing and incentives, business incentives, commercial expansion incentives, um, tax credits. Con Edison is our electric company, empowerment zones, um, food retail to support health, industrial, commercial, just tons of different financing, uh, job creation financing incentives. Um, to open in Lower Manhattan financing incentives. You may have heard of the Startup New York program. Ten years, tax-free. We're trying to get space in, in PACE, but space in New York City is hard to come across. Um, uh, Non-for-profit board programs, uh, capital guarantees, entrepreneurship funds, um, emerging technology incentives, relocation programs, sales tax exemptions, solar panel um, credits. And last thing, incubators. So if there's a program first, and then there are some incentives and financing second, now you need a place to work. So just in incubators and workspaces, um, these are just a list of, of incubators. Again, none of these existed a, f a few years ago. They're, one of the first ones, Tech Space, was um, started by an alum, and we gave space in a um, in a, a pitch contest that we run. But there was there was virtually none of them. Um, Biobat, BMW, I Ventures. You want to develop an app for cars? BMW will give you money and space to work. Um, Dumbo Incubator. Dumbo stands for down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass. Um, Entrepreneur Space, General Assembly. A couple of kids just started this. You know, a few years ago, now there are offices around the world. Harlem Biospace, Harlem Garage, um, HBK incubators for food startups, Hive at 55, where we had the, the first Fresh Biz game, um, an artist studio workspace, an urban future lab, um, SUNY, a state university of New York, uh, Staten Island, Sunshine in the Bronx, Tech Space is the one I alluded to earlier, um, and even WeWork which again was just started a few years ago, 30 locations worldwide with you know, about 15,000 members. And you could see how important the jobs are. So if you look at um, the tech space, jobs grew 28%, whereas almost all the other ones fell, like manufacturing jobs fell 30%. So here's the guy that, um, who did a lot of work on it, and the mayor on his side. <laughs> And um, so that, that's uh, New York City entrepreneurial 
ecosystem. And um, now I think we're going to hear about Tel Aviv's ecosystem. So let me bring that up. And I guess we'll have questions at the end. Maybe we could all come up and ask any, any of